Muito boa tarde a todos e todas. É um prazer enorme coordenar essa mesa aqui em nome da direção do Instituto de Economia. Mais uma das nossas atividades comemorativas dos 50 anos. Eu peço desculpas, mas em homenagem ao nosso convidado, as minhas breves palavras aqui serão em inglês. Professor Chang, thank you very much again for your presence and intense activities here in Campinas. In two days, he met a lot of colleagues and students, provided us with a brilliant lecture yesterday, and this morning talked with some journalists. Not to mention the lunches and dinners with us. We hope that this visit can produce future collaboration and we will work for that. Thank you. I would like also to thank you again, Professor Roberto Borghi, for his central role on this visit of Pro Professor Shang and our support for the staff and uh, all the colleagues involved. Well, yesterday the class was a general one about our said science, its object, methodologies, and different schools. Today, the activity is officially organized by the graduate programs, because of this, Celio is here uh, to say some words also. The topic today is a little bit more specific and as simple as restructuring the development discourse, <laughs> bringing production back in. in. Well, there could be no more appropriate topic to discuss in this house by occasion of its 50th anniversary, and especially in this specific moment in Brazilian history. The Institute of Economics, or the so-called Campinas School, was born half a century ago as a, a son, a, a rebel and critic one, but, but a son of the Latin American original structuralism. Besides the differences, some of the main messages of the Eclat School and of the Raul Prebisch and his followers, contributions, keeps at the core of the Campinas intellectual warriors. The importance of the productive structure and technology, the challenges of development, the normals, difficulties to overcome backwardness. In Brazil today, thinking about these topics is almost an invitation to depression, or at least disbelief. <laughs> On the policy front, we are watching now the fast dismantling of institutions and tools that, full of imperfections, were fundamental to our industrialization. Even five or six years ago, when there were a lot of reasons for optimism in macroeconomic, external and social fronts, the threats and regressions in the productive structures were already clear. On the intellectual front, the picture, in my opinion, is even worse. Some of the most influential economists that are every day in the newspaper and public debate are no longer ashamed of state that there is nothing special in industry. <laughs> the composition of production doesn't matter. Institutions, good institutions, are the only thing important for the development. As Nelson Rodriguez, a brilliant but very conservative Brazilian writer, use it to say, under development cannot be improvised <laughs> or spontaneous. It's a work of centuries. But the role of critical intellectuals, even in difficult times, is always thinking and rethinking the key issues. The topic of this session certainly is one of them. Especially for a peripheral economy like Brazil, in a period of financialization of capitalism, global value chains, a new technology revolution in action, and new features of international asymmetries. To help us in this huge challenge, it's a pleasure to have here with us one of the world's big experts on these complicated themes. Professor Cheung has a long and celebrated academic production about development in theoretical and historical grounds. Listening to his ideas will be certainly a privilege. Thank you very much again, Professor, and I will pass the, the floor to Sally with Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I 
would like again, uh, on behalf of the Institute of Economics, uh, thank you, Professor Cheng, uh, for accepting the invitation to uh, take part in this event to uh, celebrate our 50 years. Uh, we are very, very proud uh, of uh, receiving Professor Hajun Cheng from Cambridge University that today you have the lecture uh, bringing production back in, uh, restructuring uh, the development discourse. Uh, first of all, uh, for the intellectual height of Professor Cheng, uh, I think that few scholars can so effectively uh, combine uh, such a broad and deep theoretical back background uh, and with the capacity to understand the evolution of contemporary capitalism. Uh, and always grounded in, uh, in a very uh, well-founded knowledge about economic history, um, and also uh, by his political engagement with an ever renewed commitment uh, to influence the, the debate uh, against the narrowness of the mainstream uh, theory. Uh, second, uh, for the contribution of Professor Chang to the formation of several professors and students from the Institute of Economics, not only with the books and papers, but also uh, because several of us were able to, to attend to Professor Chen lectures in the PhD program in Cambridge, but also in the, the uh, CAPORD, the Cambridge Program for Rethink Development in Economics. Uh, and finally, for, for the importance of the uh, several works of, of Professor Chang's uh, in our undergraduate and graduate courses. Um, in, in the undergraduate level, um, I'd like to highlight the book that was the topic of the last uh, uh, yesterday lecture, uh, Economics, the User Guide, uh, that's part of the bibliography of the, the, the introduction to economics course in the in the graduate level, but also the book Kicking Away the Ladder, uh, that it's part of the uh, compulsory bibliography uh, in the international economy and economic development course. Uh, in um, the graduate level, uh, I would like to highlight um, the, the book um, did by Professor Chen, the Thinking Development Economics, that it's one of the, the main reference uh, of the discipline economic development. And within this book, uh, there's a chapter on the East Asian development experience that uh, one of the, the main reference for the analysis of uh, Asian development. Um, still in the uh, economic development uh, course, I'd like to highlight two, uh, more two very important uh, uh, papers for the discussion of the discipline. Uh, the first one is the discipline, is the, the, ch the chapter Hamlet without the Prince of uh, Denmark. In the book Towards New uh, Developmentalism, Mark as, um, uh, as uh, means rather than masters. That was edited by uh, Sharon Ken and Jens Christensen. Uh, in that book, uh, in that chapter, Professor Chang criticized the vision of development presents in multilateral organization. For example, in the uh, Millennium Development Goals of the United States uh, and the Doha Development Agenda of the WTO. Uh, and the second one is the, uh, is the paper that is published in the Journal of Institut Institut Institutional Economics, that is uh, the Institutions uh, and Economic Development Theory, Policy and History. Uh, in this paper, Professor Chang analyzed uh, prevailing view of uh, on relations between institutions and economic development, uh, drawing at attention to the danger of taking uh, kind of uh, patterns of international institutional development, typically, typically the Anglo-Saxon uh, institution as uh, a kind of universal and always uh, with a kind of uh, uh, unique sense of causality from institution to development and not the reverse causality. Uh, and finally, it's important to, to remember that uh, in the course of industrial policy uh, that we have here, the book, The Political Econ of Econ Economy of Industrial Policy, uh, is still one of the most important readings, as, uh, but also the debate between Professor Chang and Professor Justin Lin 
on industrial policy that was published uh, on the development policy review in 2009. Uh, with this, uh, I certainly that uh, from the great contemporary economic authors, uh, probably Professor Chang is maybe uh, the most present, present in our list of the bibliograph uh, bibliographical reference. And then for all this, I would like to thank again for, for Professor Chang for his presence, and I would like to wish everyone uh, a very good lecture and seminar. Thank you. Well, thank you for those very kind words of introduction. I'm yeah, really <laughs> overwhelmed by uh, the fact that uh, so many of my works are taught uh, as part of the curriculum here. And indeed, uh, this uh, presentation is an extended and developed version of uh, his earlier work, uh, Hamlet with the Prince of Denmark. Yeah. And yes, uh, the, I mean, I cannot think of a better place uh, to present this because, I mean, in terms of its attention to the world of production, development of technologies, organizations and other institutions, Unicampi is the most uh, important uh, place thank you, in the world. So I hope we can have a lot of uh, productive discussions uh, today. But uh, let me begin on a lighter note. Uh, you know, uh, this man once uh, famously said that the problem with France is that they don't have the word for entrepreneurship. Well, don't laugh. Uh, he was a busy man, you know. He had to invade Iraq, worry about North Korea, you know, arrange some construction contract for his uh, vice president, do some experiments with English grammar, you know. He, he even had to find time to choke on a pretzel, so you know, he was a busy guy, so you cannot expect him to brush up his uh, French. But he was actually articulating a fairly common Anglo-American prejudice against France as an undynamic and laid-back country, full of meddling bureaucrats, pompous waiters, and time-wasting time pseudo-intellectuals. So this is his image of France, you know, people are having party all the time, you know, the, the, they don't go and make money, you know. Now I'll show you how this concept, conception of France is completely wrong in a few minutes. But the perspective behind this uh, statement is actually widely accepted. Yeah? I mean, we all agree that you need entrepreneurial people to have a successful economy. So in this view, the poverty of developing countries is mainly attributed to the lack of entrepreneurship. So when rich people go to a developing country and witness a scene like this, they say, aha, we know why this country is po uh, poor. You know, I mean, Look at all these men you know, sitting there for whole day, you know, having 11 cups of mint tea and yeah, uh, smoking the hookahs and, you know, these countries need people who can go out and make money, you know, movers and shakers, entrepreneurs, whatever you may call them, you know, don't just sit around, you know, go around, da, da, go out and make money. Yeah? Of course, people in this room, or for that matter, anyone who has lived at least for a short period in a developing country will know that this is actually a less typical scene. The more typical scenes will be like this, yeah? You know, thousands and millions of people trying to sell everything that can be sold and even things that you never knew could be sold, yeah? 
No, uh, let me uh, give you a few examples. I mean, I'm sure that you all uh, living in Brazil that, uh, have uh, similar examples. But for example, in the 1980s, when someone invented this uh, the, the annoying answering machine you know, that uh, you have to go through in order to talk to anyone at the American embassy, the only way to get the uh, American uh, visa interview application was uh, to line up in front of the American embassy. Yeah? So in those days, uh, when I was a uh, young man, I mean, uh, it uh, created this uh, uh, new class of entrepreneurs, which I can only call professional cures. Yeah? These are people who queue for money. Yeah? So what do they do? They wake up at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning and uh, stand in front of the American embassy. Yeah? And come five to nine, when the embassy is about to open, some guy in sharp suit comes along and says, wow, your spot looks really nice. Would you mind selling it to me? Yeah? And of course, uh, you're a good businessman, so you would immediately sell it. So you will say, oh, you know, my uncle in Los Angeles, uh, that, uh, he's uh, dying, you know, I have to go and see him, you know. And the guy says, no, no, I'll give you two, $200. Yeah? No, 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 he's uh, really sick. He's uh, like my real father because my father died young. I'll give you $400. No, 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 I have to go 500 Okay, he can die. Yeah? <laughs> Another personal example is, uh, you know, when I went to South Africa uh, for, yeah, that was the second time I was in Johannesburg, and a friend of mine took me to a restaurant so he parked a car on the street and we were walking towards the restaurant and suddenly some guy turned up and told my friend, oh, uh, wa uh, while you're eating, I'll watch your car. And my friend said, oh yeah, do that, and gave him some money. So I said, w w what are you doing? I mean, watch your car? Well, he said, no, 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 what it means is that if you don't pay me, I'll slash your tire while you're eating. Eh? <laughs> you know, there are people who are desperate for survival and they have to invent jobs. Yeah? I mean, another uh, interesting story I heard was uh, about uh, the, this uh, uh, young enterprising man in the Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, which I can tell you has worse traffic than Sao Paulo. Yeah? No, it's uh, the only place I've been to which has worse traffic than Sao Paulo. Yeah? <laughs> anyway, so the, uh, in order to avoid the, the uh, sorry, reduce congestion. Apparently, the, the Jakarta city government a few years ago introduced this uh, carpool lane. Yeah? So if uh, in your car there are more than three people, you can drive there quickly or you have to queue. Yeah? So this uh, the, created this uh, young new entrepreneurs who would stand around at the entrance of, uh, at the start of the carpool lane and some guy in a you know, Toyota Land Cruiser pulls up and says, you, you get in, yeah? Yeah, so he drives on the carpool lane. At the end of it, he pays uh, this young man $3 or whatever. You know, everyone's happy, yeah? He's happy because he got there quickly. These young men are happy because uh, they earn money, yeah? You know, this is the reality of developing countries. You know, I'm, I'm sure that each of you can give me three examples like that from Brazil. Yeah? In contrast, these uh, the, the developing countries where everyone is an entrepreneur, more or less, most uh, citizens of rich countries have not even come near to becoming an entrepreneur. Yeah? They typically work for a large company, hiring thousands, sometimes tens of thousands, even sometimes millions of people doing very highly specialized jobs and in the process realizing someone else's entrepreneurial vision. Yeah? Yeah, actually, I, I still remember that in the 1980s when I was doing some study of uh, the comparative study of uh, Japanese and uh, American uh, automobile manufacturing industries, I, uh, one of the books said that, uh, that the engineers in General Motors were over-specialized compared to the engineers in uh, Japan. And there was this guy who spent his entire life designing door handles, yeah? And when you talk to him, you uh, realize that this guy 
has no idea how the door is made, not to speak of uh, uh, the car. Yeah? And indeed, if you compare the numbers, uh, this is very clear. I mean, uh, of course, there's a bit of problem in defining, uh, sorry, equating entrepreneurship with uh, self-employment, but it's I mean, uh, a reasonable the, the, the indicator. And if you count the proportion of uh, people who are self-employed, you will realize that the chance of someone in a developing country becoming an entrepreneur, i.e. self-employed, is at least uh, twice up to 13 times higher than the chance of uh, someone in a rich country becoming an entrepreneur. And the interesting thing is that according to these numbers, the US is actually even less entrepreneurial than France. Yeah? <laughs> I mean, not a big difference. So this is a classic case of a kettle calling the pot black. You know? These are I mean, other than Norway, actually the two least entrepreneurial countries in the world, you know. I mean, other countries have higher ratio, like, you know, Spain, Portugal, you know. And present the one country calls the other country, you yeah, know, lacking in entrepreneurship. Yeah? Now then, the, uh, we are faced with a mystery, because if people in developing countries are so much more entrepreneurial than the people in rich countries, why are they poor? Yeah? The most popular answer to this in the last couple of decades actually has been that poor people in developing countries are poor because they do not have the money with which to engage in entrepreneurship. Yeah? Lack of credit. Yeah? And this is a thinking behind the popular microfinance movement represented by the, the Grameen Bank of Bangladesh. You know, this uh, practice of lending very small sums, you know, $100, $120, or money to poor people, often, although not always, using kind of uh, collective responsibility as uh, collateral rather than real asset because these people don't have any assets, so they are organized into these uh, so-called solidarity groups. So if uh, one of them don't uh, pay back the loan, the others are asked to pay back. So they put pressure on this person. Yeah? Anyway, so the, in this uh, microfinance uh, scheme, uh, basically poor people are lent uh, a small amount of money so that they can use it to start their business and eventually get out of poverty and stand on their own feet. Yeah? Microfinance became so popular, especially in the early 2000s, that in 2006, the Grameen Bank and its founder, Dr. Muhammad Yunus, was even given the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah, yeah this must be the first time when that, 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 that people are given Nobel Peace Prize for making money. Yeah? No, because that, that is, that, that, that microfinance institutions are not charities. Yeah? No, they make money. I mean, uh, many of them are actually barely better than the uh, money lenders. Yeah? Because uh, there's this uh, infamous uh, Mexican microfinance bank uh, called Compartamos, whose uh, the average interest rate is uh, something like 120%. There's an even worse one in the Nigeria called Lapo, which is known to charge up to 200%. You know, Grameen Bank is a nice one, but they charge uh, the 40, 50 percent. Yeah? Anyway, I mean, uh, never mind uh, the, the, this uh, high interest rate, but uh, the, there was so much hype that you know, this is the solution to poverty. Yeah? So don't give people handouts, yeah? like Bolsa Familia. Yeah? Give them money to start business, that way they become independent. Yeah? So there was a huge amount of hope about this. But then study after study that looked at this came out with the conclusion that actually the impact doesn't exist. Yeah? Poverty hasn't been reduced. Yeah? I mean, one obvious reason is that, uh, you know, <laughs> when you are paying interest rate of 100%, I mean, you cannot make money, yeah? But even, yeah, 
uh, that, that if you kind of ignore that, there's a serious uh, problem with the thinking because basically the poor individuals taking on the loans have very low productive capabilities. And that makes it impossible for them to get out of poverty with this uh, enterprise uh, scheme. Let me explain. So back in 1997, the Grameen Bank teamed up with uh, Telenor, the, which is the state-owned phone company of Norway, and gave out uh, micro loans uh, to women to buy a mobile phone and rent it out. Yeah? So the Telenor gave Grameen Bank this uh, phones at discount, and Grameen Bank, yeah, I hope but uh, sold these uh, phones at, uh, at discount uh, to these uh, the, the poor people. But then, of course, uh, they don't have money to buy it outright. So they you know, had to take out a loan from the Grameen Bank uh, to buy the phone. Now, initially, this uh, business was very successful because this was a time when Bangladesh had a $300 per capita income. Hardly anyone had access to e even landline telephone. So the fact that uh, there is a lady with a mobile phone in your village was a very good thing because uh, they could now call their relatives in another village or another city. So these uh, ladies who are renting out uh, the phone, uh, who are called the telephone ladies, made good money. Apparently, the, the, they made anything between 750 and $1,200 per year, which is two, three, four times the national average income. Yeah? So it was very good business, and naturally, everyone wanted a piece of it, uh, action. Yeah? So a lot of people took out a loan, bought this phone, rented it out, but then there were so many of uh, these uh, telephone ladies by 2005, the average income of these uh, telephone ladies fell to $70. Yeah? So from 1000 to 70 yeah? In the meantime, Bangladesh's uh, per capita income uh, grew to $450. Yeah? So a business that could uh, bring you up to four times uh, national average income was now <coughs> struggling to bring you 15% of uh, national income. Yeah? What happened? Yeah? Now, when you think about it, uh, the, this problem would not have existed if uh, these uh, telephone ladies uh, could continuously open up new lines of business. Yeah? So, okay, renting a mobile phone is that, that, uh, uh, not profitable. Let's get into repairing mobile phones yeah? or manufacturing mobile phones or designing uh, software uh, for, I don't know, games uh, that are in, on mobile phones. Yeah, yeah then that, uh, you keep uh, entering new business and uh, you don't you know, that, that have uh, the segment uh, crowded and you will maintain your profit. Yeah? Now, of course, that, uh, you are laughing at this uh, suggestion. Yeah? I mean, this uh, poor semi-illiterate uh, ladies in the rural Bangladesh, I mean, the, where are they going to get the, the, the abilities uh, to write a mobile phone app or, you know, fix uh, the, the, if not manufacture mobile phones? The problem this example shows is that you know, the people borrowing these uh, microloans have very low productive capabilities and therefore there's a very limited range of businesses that these uh, people can take on, which gets very quickly crowded, especially if yeah. I mean, the, the, uh, a lot of uh, microfinance institutions are set up uh, to take advantage of this demand. Yeah? You know, so the, the, I, I heard uh, someone half jokingly saying that uh, in the Phnom Penh, the capital city of Cambodia, the country is apparently flooded with uh, microfinance because a lot of uh, the, you know, uh, the foreign governments are the giving money to these uh, financial uh, institutions to uh, basically help uh, Cambodia reduce poverty. 
and he said, you know, when you go to Phnom Penh, that there are so many people, you know, selling noodles on the street. There are actually more people selling noodles than people who can eat noodles. Yeah? No, because when you think about it, I mean, what are you going to do if you are given, I don't know, seventy dollars as a loan when you are, uh, you know, semi-illiterate, yeah? uh, middle-aged uh, woman from a developing country? Yeah? I mean, probably there are like uh, three things that uh, that you can do. You can sell that, that, you know, that, that some pastries. You can sell noodles, or you can sell, the, I don't know, hand-woven baskets. Yeah? But there's not much more you can do. Yeah? And this is why when you initially lend money, yeah, a few people succeed. Yeah? I mean, this is a classic case of uh, fallacy of composition. Yeah? And then everyone says, yes, I mean, the solution to the Cambodia's poverty problem is to give these uh, poor women money yeah? so that they can start business. Yeah? Soon the market is overcrowded, a lot of people, yeah? Uh, cannot even uh, the repay the loan, and at best uh, they are back to square one. Anyway, I cannot go into this uh, story of microfinance. I mean, uh, if you're interested, uh, there's a quick introductory chapter on it in this uh, the book, chapter 15. Or you can visit my website and read a couple of articles of microfinance that I've co-authored with my friend Milford Bateman, who's a real expert on microfinance. The reason why I brought up this uh, microfinance today is uh, not to speak about uh, microfinance mainly, but uh, to show you how the current state of development discourse is. Yeah? Because it is all about reducing poverty given the current levels of capabilities. Yeah? You know, until the 1970s, there was a general consensus that economic development is essentially about the transformation of the abilities to produce or productive capabilities, for short. Although people fiercely debated how to achieve it. Yeah? So Walt Rostow on the right said, yeah, basically the free the market, this will naturally happen. You know, dependency theorists uh, at the other end of the political spectrum said, you need to have a socialist revolution and kick out the, the compradors. Yeah? Somewhere in the middle, you had the Latin American structuralists. Yeah? Albert Hirschman's uh, unbalanced growth, Rodenstein, Rodin's uh, balanced growth, but they were all about industrialization and a bit more broadly transformation of the productive structure and the underlying productive capabilities. Yeah? And indeed uh, most of us uh, still uh, hold this uh, view of development at the instinctive level because a lot of people will say things like oh yeah you know the, the countries like I don't know Brunei, Qatar you know these uh, countries that are only rich uh, that, that because they have a lot of uh, oil, you know, they are not really developed, you know. Or when the, the German per capita income fell to the level of Mexico's uh, right after the Second World War, no one said that, that uh, this country should be reclassified as a developing country. Eh? You know, people knew that the Germans still had the technology and organization capabilities and managerial capabilities to rebuild their economy, which they did within 10 years, yeah? the so-called miracle on the Rhine. Yeah? So we are still implicitly accepting that economic development is about the ability to produce rather than about simple command over resources. Yeah? Unfortunately, however, the, during the last uh, three decades, uh, the dominant view has become that economic development is basically about poverty reduction and probably a more widespread provision of basic needs, as best illustrated by this uh, famous uh, Millennium Development Goals, which uh, the kind of framed uh, the UN and other government actions on development between 2000 and 2015. Now, when you look at this, there's uh, the virtually nothing about 
production, not to speak of uh, transforming the productive uh, system. Eh? Well, things have uh, become a bit better because uh, the, the post-2015 SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, include a couple of items on related to production. So goal eight is decent work and economic growth. And goal nine is industry, innovation, infrastructure. But, well, first of all, you will notice that uh, there are numbers eight and nine. You know, they are not, yeah, like, uh, the, the very high on the list. And the overall framework is still about poverty reduction, basic needs, and this kind of stuff. Yeah? So why has uh, the, our vision of development been so radically transformed? Yeah? Behind this uh, transformation, I would say, have been three intellectual trends. First of all is uh, neoliberalism. Since the 1980s, uh, neoliberalism has uh, become the dominant economic doctrine. And as you all know, this is an economic doctrine that <coughs> argues that uh, the best economic policies are essentially a slightly modified version of 19th century liberal policy, namely laissez-faire policy. I mean, the liberal here I'm using in the European sense, yeah? Because Americans, when they say liberal, they essentially mean what Europeans call social democrats, yeah? like Ted Kennedy and these people. Yeah? But I mean, the, the, in the original the European usage, uh, liberal means uh, basically the economic laissez-faire. Yeah? I say modify because uh, the neoliberalism is actually somewhat different from original li uh, liberalism of the 19th century. For example, the original liberals did not want the central bank. Yeah? I mean, they thought that there should be competition in the issuing of money. Yeah? I mean, some uh, people still hold this view. You know, Hayek uh, is known to have uh, supported this view. 19th century liberals were against the uh, intellectual property rights. Because that, uh, they thought this were, these were the artificially created monopoly. Yeah? And actually there was a famous uh, anti-pattern movement in 19th century Europe, famously supported by the liberal magazine, The Economist, which were led by free market economists. Yeah? Actually, when you think about it, these people are more consistent than today's uh, neoliberals. Yeah? Because if you want competition, yeah, you have to have competition everywhere. Yeah? Why do you restrict uh, competition in the area of ideas? Yeah? Anyway, so that, that this uh, neoliberal thinking that, that was very influential in that, uh, reshaping our vision of development. First of all, it is uh, based on, although as I argued yesterday, not synonymous uh, with neoclassical economics. Yeah? So not all neoclassical econo uh, economists that uh, support the free market, they, not all economists, uh, neoclassical economists are neoliberals. Yeah? Because there are people like Joe Stiglitz, uh, Paul Krugman, Danny Roderick, I mean, who are all neoclassicals, but uh, who are not neoliberals. But one thing that is uh, clear is that uh, neoclassical economics is at the foundation of neoliberalism, and neoclassical economics, as I argued yesterday, is basically about market exchange and has very little to say about production. You know, of course, that is the so-called theory of production, but you know, I mean, uh, what is neoclassical the theory of production? I mean, it's not a theory. I mean, it's basically saying you combine some abstract quanta called capital with another abstract quanta called labor according to some formula which we will call technology and something gets produced. Yeah? It's not a theory. You know? <laughs> anyway, uh, so much so that uh, Ronald Coase, uh, who got the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1991 in his uh, Nobel lecture, 
despite being in general that, that, uh, sympathetic to neoclassical economics, criticized neoclassical economics for being about, and I'm quoting Coase, lone individuals exchanging nuts and berries on the edge of a forest. Yeah? So it's basically saying uh, that these guys have no theory of production. Yeah? There's no theory of the farm. You know? It's about kind of contextless uh, individual who accidentally meet on the edge of a forest and they find that in that particular occasion they have a mutual interest in exchanging some surplus uh, goods that they have. Yeah? That's neoclassical economics. Yeah? So production is at, uh, almost completely absent in neoclassical economics and yeah, no wonder that we got to ignore yeah, uh, issues uh, to do with uh, production. Secondly, in <coughs> sorry, neoliberal and therefore neoclassical uh, economic theory in this instance, the issues surrounding the development of productive capabilities are assumed away as uh, these capabilities are seen as given and universally distributed. Yeah, so the, think about the heckscher orlin theory of comparative advantage. Eh? In that uh, theory, well, like in other parts of uh, neoclassical theory, it is assumed that for each good, there's one best practice technology which anyone can use. However, different goods use different combinations of labor and capital, and therefore different countries will have different efficiencies in producing that particular product. So if you have Guatemala with lots of labor and little capital, of course in relative terms, you will specialize in labor intensive, uh, well, goods using labor intensive products like textile. If you are Germany with lots of capital and uh, little labor, you will produce goods that use a lot of capital and little labor, like automobile. Mm -hmm. However, note that in this theory, it is not as if Guatemala cannot produce things like BMWs. It can. Mm -hmm. It's only that it shouldn't, given its relative factor in domain. Mm -hmm. Because that, uh, in this model, like in that, 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 virtually all of uh, neoclassical theory, it is assumed that anyone has the, uh, sorry, everyone has the technological capabilities to use any technology. Yeah? yeah, so in this theory, basically the issue of development of uh, productive capabilities are assumed away. Yeah? Thirdly, believing in the power of the free market, the neoliberal discourse criticizes any attempt to deliberately enhance productive capabilities through public policy intervention as being best, uh, at best futile and at worst counterproductive. Yeah? So no infant industry protection, no forced uh, savings uh, through fiscal manipulation and so on. So you can see how the very structure of neoclassical economics makes us not think about issues to do with production. Eh? Another intellectual trend that is behind the decline of the interest in production has uh, come from the left of the political spectrum, if you like. So since the 1980s, there's been a humanist reaction against what was seen as the collectivist, materialist biases of the early development discourse. I mean, uh, this uh, intellectual trend is, of course, uh, represented by the Amartya Sen. The interesting thing, however, is that Amartya Sen's uh, the PhD, which was done under the supervision of uh, the Marxist economist at uh, uh, Maurice Dove in Cambridge was exactly arguing for something like that. Yeah? So he actually undermined his uh, the earlier position 
except that he didn't say that I was wrong in the past, that uh, he you know, didn't mention it at all. Anyway, the early development theories were mainly about transforming the pro productive structures, yeah? but through these aggregate measures. Yeah? So transfer surpluses, yeah? transfer by labor force. Yeah? So it, I mean, it, it was I mean, thought in these uh, very aggregate terms. And in applying these theories, individuals were forgotten or worse, uh, repressed in the name of the greater good called economic development. Yeah? So this has uh, made the humanists emphasize the need to enhance individual capabilities through things like health, education, and empowerment. Yeah? And this is all embodied in the MDGs. Yeah? Feed people, educate them, give them uh, health care, empower them, yeah, especially women, and that's uh, the essence of development. Yeah? And then there was uh, the, the post-industrial knowledge economy discourse. According to this view, rising income has brought about the shift in demand towards services, making material production increasingly less important <coughs> less important. The advocates of this view cite cases like Switzerland and Singapore as examples of service-based uh, economic success. They also talk about India's recent success with uh, service export, especially knowledge-based services. Yeah, so India has uh, the, the, the had a uh, big success in exporting you know, software, you know, the exporting uh, the kind of call centers. You know, they, they have provided the uh, back office functions to airlines and credit card companies. And yeah, so some people have used uh, this example as uh, the proof that it is not necessary to industrialize anymore to have economic development. Some people go even further and say that, yeah, actually countries should actively try to skip industrialization because industrialization is uh, the passé. Yeah? It's uh, yesterday's industry. They should uh, the look into the future, you know, join the service revolution. And in this uh, discourse, uh, the issue of productive development is almost <coughs> completely ignored because it is implicitly assumed that even the poorest countries possess the capability to compete in services. Yeah, actually, this point is never explicitly discussed, but the implicit assumption is, yes, uh, it is uh, difficult for, I don't know, the Philippines to develop automobile manufacturing, but yeah, I mean, they can run call centers. I mean, they, uh, they have a lot of people who speak English. Yeah? So willy-nilly, you know, the, this uh, the issue of uh, productive uh, capabilities uh, ignored. Okay, so these are three powerful intellectual trends, although they are not necessarily from the same people, you know, came together to rad radically restructure our vision of development. Huh? But let me go through them and try to show how they are very problematic. Eh? I mean, on the first point, neoliberalism, you know, I have written extensively the, how there's am, ample historical evidence showing that not only is industrialization necessary for economic development, but it does not happen automatically through market forces. So first of all, neoliberal policies have failed to generate economic development in the last three and a half decades. You know, especially in the Latin America and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, which have most uh, faithfully followed uh, this uh, neoliberal recipe imposed by the World Bank and the IMF and embraced uh, by segments of uh, the elite. These countries have basically seen their economic growth collapse and experienced 
premature deindustrialization, as uh, my friend Gabriel Palma called it. You know, Brazil is, uh, as I said yesterday, a dramatic example, a country that used to produce uh, more manufactured uh, products uh, than all of uh, Korea, China, Taiwan put together until like 1970, a country that had a manufacturing sector that accounted for nearly 30% of GDP until the mid-1980s, now has a manufacturing sector that is barely 10%. Yeah? In terms of overall growth too, you know, the Latin American right love to talk about the disasters of import substitution. Yeah? You think that, 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 that there was, you know, like economic collapse and famine, you know, throughout the 1960s and 70s, yeah? But, you know, Latin American uh, countries that uh, used to grow it uh, the, in per capita terms, 3.1% per year, yeah, which is uh, slightly higher than, you know, developing country average. Even Sub-Saharan Africa, the, it, uh, you know, uh, yeah, the, this is uh, the wrong, uh, because uh, it's uh, from a World Bank table that uh, split Sub-Saharan Africa into two different bits, uh, so let's uh, the, look at this table. You know, it uh, used to grow at 1.6% uh, on average in the 60s and 70s. In the next uh, 35 years, uh, economic growth collapsed. Yeah? In Latin American uh, countries, it uh, was uh, reduced to one quarter of what it used to be, yeah? from 3.1 to 0 0.8. In Africa, 1.6, okay, I mean, this was not a great rate, but it's not something you can laugh at, because this is essentially the rate that today's rich countries grew during the Industrial Revolution. Yeah? It uh, the, fell to 0.3 percent. Yeah? You know, if you grow at 0.3 percent for 36 years, it means that at the end of the 36 years, your income is 11 percent higher than what it was 36 years ago. You know, China grows at 11 uh, percent in a year. Yeah? And basically, African countries have been staying in the same place yeah, for one whole generation. Yeah? I think at this point is uh, the, you know, ha has to be repeated all the time. Yeah? Because there's such a strong myth about you know, Latin American import substitution having been a disaster. And you know, OK, not everything was great uh, after the neoliberal reforms, but at least we are now growing faster. You know. No, this is bullshit. Yeah? And I've been, I mean, I've been coming to Brazil for the last 20 years, and you know, I've been saying this at the, for the last 20 years, and every time I meet someone who hasn't heard of that. Yeah? Yeah, Latin America and uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa are most more extreme examples, but uh, from this table you can see that basically the same applies everywhere. Yeah? The world economy that, uh, used to... Sorry, I'm missing a table, I'm sorry. Yeah. Anyway, the world economy uh, used to grow at about 2.6, uh, 2.7% in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And then in the last uh, 36 years, it has been growing half that rate. Yeah? So basically, neoliberalism, despite this uh, pretension that, yes, uh, it may be bad for inequality and stuff like that, but it is at least uh, good for growth, is uh, completely misleading. Yeah? Also, we know that almost all of Today's rich countries, when they were developing countries, developed by using state intervention like, uh, sorry about deformatting it, uh, trade protectionism, industrial subsidies, state owned enterprises, and regulation of foreign direct investments. I mean, I have written about this point in these books, yeah? yeah. 
As for the humanists, uh, their problem is not that they are not interested in capabilities per se, but they try to raise capabilities at the individual level. Mainly through investment in health and education. But there are only so many productive capabilities that can be developed through improvement at the individual level. First of all, development in productive capabilities mainly occur inside productive enterprises rather than at the individual level. You know, to put it a bit provocatively, what really distinguishes the United States or Germany on the one hand and the Philippines or, or Nigeria on the other hand are their Boeings and Volkswagens and not their economists or medical doctors, you know. Nigeria and the Philippines uh, produce a lot of uh, economists, a lot of medical doctors, yeah? a lot of engineers, yeah? except that they are all driving taxis in uh, New York or serving as maid in Hong Kong. Yeah? Secondly, in addition to development of business enterprises, you need the development of a series of collective institutions that encourage and help different economic actors work together. So you need institutions to manage uh, capital labor uh, conflict and encourage collaboration at the firm level. You need institutions that uh, encourage cooperation among firms within and across sectors. Yeah, so that, that a lot of uh, writings on the so-called industrial districts and Italy and uh, Germany have emphasized how you know, the small and medium-sized firms in the, these uh, the, the, uh, industrial districts, while competing fiercely on some fronts, also cooperated with e each other by setting up joint research center, joint research mar uh, the marketing uh, activities, and so on. You need uh, the good government uh, business interaction. You need industry academia partnership, and so on and so on. So, you know, this idea that all you need is uh, to make uh, individuals healthier and more educated while in itself is a good thing is not even nearly enough uh, in creating productive capabilities because most of our productive capabilities are generated in a collective way. Yeah, so a simple way to see the importance of these uh, collective dimensions of productive capabilities is to think how when an engineer moves from a poor country like, I don't know, Nigeria or the, the, uh, Ecuador to a rich country like Germany or United States sees his uh, productivity shooting up uh, through the roof. Yeah? Because now he's uh, working with a huge, uh, the, if you like, infrastructure. Yeah? He's uh, situated in a very productive firm, which is situated in a the, the very the, the, the supportive uh, industrial ecosystem, yeah? buoyed up by the, the good infrastructure, you know, good the, 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 the government support. Yeah, so the, the same guy with the same skill, same knowledge, sees uh, his uh, productivity you know, increase at, uh, enormously. Eh? So the neglect of these collective dimensions of productive capabilities is an important gap in the humanist tradition. Actually, it's a real pity because uh, there is nothing in the, the Amartya Sen's uh, capability framework that excludes uh, the exploration of these uh, collective dimensions of capabilities. Unfortunately, the people working in that tradition don't seem to be interested in this. So if uh, you are working in this uh, framework, I really plead to you that you should uh, look at these uh, collective dimensions. Eh? As for the post-industrial knowledge economy, first of all, the increasing share of services actually does not mean that material production is not important anymore. Actually, we are 
consuming more material products than ever. Many, although not countries, uh, not all countries are producing more material products than ever. However, it looks like uh, the share of services is increasing because uh, services are becoming relatively more expensive because productivity growth in manufacturing is much faster. Yeah? So to give you a kind of uh, intuitive example, you know, with the money that uh, you had to spend to buy a good, say, laptop, say, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you can buy three, maybe even four laptops of uh, equal or greater power today. Yeah? However, you don't necessarily have uh, four laptops. Yeah? You probably have two, yeah? but not four. So it looks like you are produce, uh, the consuming less uh, the laptop yeah? because now you are spending only half the money that you used to on laptops, but actually you are uh, consuming more laptops. Yeah? On the other hand, you used to have, I don't know, one haircut a month, 15, 20 years ago, you still have one haircut. Yeah? You are spending the same money because that, that, that haircut, that, that productiv that, the haircutting productivity has uh, not increased. Yeah? So you think uh, that, that when you look at it in today's uh, the prices, you think that now you are devoting far more a uh, far greater proportion of uh, your income to haircutting than to computers, but actually it's the, the, the reality is the reverse. Yeah? The problem is that uh, a lot of services are inherently impervious uh, to productivity growth. Yeah? So for example, if uh, there's a the piece of string, string quartet by Mozart that takes uh, 27 minutes to play, you, know, you cannot uh, play that uh, three times the speed and say, I ha we have increased uh, the, our productivity by three times. Yeah? So for things like performing art, that uh, productivity growth is uh, virtually impossible. Yeah? Whereas in manufacturing, where you can mechanize, you can uh, use chemical processes, yeah? I mean, you can increase uh, productivity by thousands of times. Yeah? Anyway, the, so if you actually look at the data and recalculate uh, the shares of uh, different sectors in the economy using constant prices, you find some surprising results. You know, for example, between the early 1990s and early 2010s, Germany, Italy, France also quite a lot of reduction in the share of uh, manufacturing output by 20% in Germany, 30% in Italy, 40% in France. Yeah, so this is not percentage point reduction. Yeah? So it means uh, if it's at 20% uh, reduction, it means uh, falling from 20% of GDP to 16% and so on. Yeah? But if you recalculate it, uh, the, the numbers uh, for these countries, you realize that in all three countries, the fall in the share of manufacturing was between 5 and 10 percent. Yeah? It wasn't that large. In other countries, actually, the manufacturing sector became larger, uh, becomes larger if you recalculate them in the constant prices. So in the, the US and Switzerland, actually, the, the increased by 5 percent. Finland and Sweden, manufacturing sector in real terms is, uh, was actually 50 times greater than in 1990. But these countries saw such high increase in the productivity in manufacturing in current prices, it looked like the share of manufacturing in their economies was falling. Yeah? Secondly, the, a lot of uh, recent productivity growth in service sectors has been illusory. 
I mean, finance is the clearest example. You know, the, all these financial companies, banks, yeah, they're raking in huge profits. And you thought that, that, that by inventing all these uh, the alchemical financial products, they were increasing the productivity of the financial industry. Yeah? And there came the financial crisis. We spent literally trillions of dollars uh, to prop them up. Yeah? I mean, uh, was there any productivity growth? I don't think so. Yeah. Maybe negative, yeah. Even in the areas like retail, you know, especially in Britain and the, the United States, uh, there is supposed to have been a huge increase in productivity. But are we really measuring the right thing? Because that, you know, yeah, there was increase in productivity in the sense that these companies were selling more things per worker, but in terms of the quality of the retail service, it has actually I mean, the, the dramatically the fallen. Yeah? So the, let me give you an example. When I first went to the uh, United Kingdom to study as a graduate student in 1986, if you want to buy a pair of shoes, you go to a shoe shop. Yeah? And within a couple of minutes, someone will come to you and serve you, you know, you try a few pairs, yeah, you buy the shoes, uh, you leave after like, I don't know, 15 minutes, yeah? Today, you go, go to a shoe shop, in many of them you have to take a ticket, and then you have to wait for like 20 minutes, yeah? Before your number comes up, yeah? Your number comes up, you go to the shop assistant, but this assistant is uh, dealing with three customers at the same time. So even if you say, oh yeah, this doesn't fit, give me another size, uh, she will say, yeah, I, I'll get uh, you a new pair. She disappears, doesn't come back for 10 minutes, yeah? And then you look around and uh, she's uh, talking to another customer there, you think it's rude to intervene, yeah? But then uh, after a while you get fed up, so you go and talk to her, uh, that, uh, what are you doing? That, uh, I've been waiting for 15 minutes. She says, oh yeah, I'll be with you in a, a, a few minutes and then takes another 10 minutes to come, yeah? Yeah, so after like uh, one hour, you buy your pair of shoes. So the shoe shop, actually with one sales assistant, must have uh, sold three pairs of shoes. But the service product, retail service that you got, is far worse than what it used to be. I'm not saying that there's an obvious way to measure actually the, the quality of service, but you know, this is a serious problem. Yeah? So a lot of retail revolution has been achieved by passing on the cost to the customers. Yeah? They wait longer, they drive longer, they walk more in the bigger store. Yeah? So was there really productivity growth? Also, most uh, high, most high value services like finance, engineering, design, and so on, mainly sell to the manufacturing sector, so they cannot really prosper if the manufacturing sector is weakened. Of course, uh, some degree of international specialization in these services without a manufacturing base is possible, but over time, your competitiveness will be eroded as many of these services require a close and constant interaction between the service provider and the customers. Yeah? So let me give you an example. Uh, there's this uh, very famous uh, semiconductor company called ARM Arm in Cambridge, England. Yeah? Now this company does not produce a single microchip in England. Yeah? It uh, designs uh, the very high quality custom made chips all these chips are manufactured in East Asia, in Korea, in China, in Malaysia. I have a friend who used to work for them, and he told me, yeah, I predict uh, that in the next uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, probably the company will move to East Asia. This is uh, becoming ridiculous. I mean, we are traveling all the time, I mean, spending weeks and weeks in uh, factories in Shenzhen and uh, the, the Kuala Lumpur and, you know, we, we need to uh, uh, interact with these people all the time because it's uh, custom-made uh, chips. I mean, it's not like uh, something you can just send an instruction and uh, get produced. Yeah? 
So yes, uh, over time, even the, the, the many of these uh, specialized services uh, will migrate because uh, the, they, they need the, the customer base. Yeah? But then how about countries like Switzerland and Singapore? Yeah? Well, Switzerland is actually a very interesting case because, uh, okay, I'm going to uh, tell you about this uh, in a roundabout way by talking about this uh, movie called The Third Man. I mean, it's a very old movie. I, I think uh, that not many people in this room uh, were born before this uh, movie was made in 1949. Uh, yeah, the movie is uh, the set in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War in Vienna, and it's about black market in penicillin. Eh? So penicillin at the time was a highly prized commodity because the British Alexander Fleming got, uh, invented it. They manufactured a little bit, but uh, basically only the Americans could uh, manufacture it in large quantity. And yeah, I mean the American the, uh, uh, army occupation army in Vienna basically controlled who gets uh, penicillin. Eh? And then some people kind of uh, got it out illegally and then diluted it and uh, people died of it. And yeah, so it's about that story. The script for the movie was uh, written by the famous uh, British novelist uh, Graham Greene, who later turned it into a novel. But actually, there's one uh, part of the dialogue, or in this case, a monologue, uh, that was in the movie but it's not in the book because it was written not by Graham Greene, but by the leading actor, Orson Welles. Yeah? You probably have watched this uh, Citizen Kane, yeah? uh, his uh, better known movie. In the movie, Orson Welles appears as this uh, evil character called Harry Lyme, who fakes uh, his death uh, in order to avoid uh, police capture. But then a friend of his, goes to Vienna, trying to find out what uh, happened to him, and then initially assumes that he died in an accident, and then later realizes that this guy is still alive, and actually is a, basically the, 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 the underworld the, the, you know, crime kingpin. Yeah? So the, he confronts uh, the Harry Lime, and Harry Lime uh, launches himself into this uh, diatribe basically about you know being bad is good yeah his argument is you know bad people actually did a lot of good things good people are boring they never did anything interesting yeah? so in order to make that point uh, he brings this up uh, he says in italy under the borgias for 30 years they had all the bad things about human nature you know murder poisoning you know bloodshed, but they gave us uh, Leonardo da Vinci and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love, 500 years of uh, democracy and peace, and what did they pr produce? The cuckoo clock, yeah? Yeah, very persuasive point, you know. I'm not going to yeah, trade a cuckoo clock at, uh, for the Renaissance, yeah? Now, the interesting thing is that actually, in the last two sentences, only 23 words, Orson Welles managed to insert five falsehoods, five lies. So let's find out what the five lies are there. I mean, you wouldn't imagine. Okay, first of all, 500 years of democracy, well, you know, I don't know about other people, but I don't call a country where half the population can vote a democracy. Swiss women got their votes only in 1971. Actually, only in 1991, if you count these uh, two row cantons, which uh, refused to give women votes in local elections. Eh? Yeah, so the Swiss democracy is only 25 years old. Eh? not 500 years old. When Orson Welles was uh, the, talking about it, uh, it was minus 42 years old. Yeah? It didn't exist. 
500 years of peace, well, not quite. I mean, this is the, the least uh, the, of the lies that uh, they had a few wars with uh, their neighbors. 500 years of brotherly love, no way. They had four civil wars in the 200 years in the 17th and uh, between 17th and uh, 19th century. Eh? So what brotherly love are we talking about? Eh? And the cuckoo clock was not invented in Switzerland. <laughs> it was invented in Germany. And finally, Switzerland is not a country that lives of uh, black money deposited in its banks uh, by third world dictators. It's not an economy that lives of selling tacky souvenirs like cuckoo clocks uh, to Japanese and American tourists. It is actually the most industrialized country in the world. You know, people think uh, even if you like Switzerland, people think, yeah, the country basically lives on services like banking and tourism. No, actually it is literally the most industrialized economy in the world. It has the highest per capita manufacturing output in the world. 86% higher than that of the United States, nearly nine times more than what the supposed workshop of the world, China, produces. Yeah, and Singapore never st uh, stops uh, surprising you because uh, the, this is uh, the second most industrialized economy in the world. Yeah? So in between what I said about Singapore yesterday and this, you can basically rip up everything that you thought uh, knew about Singapore. Yeah? Look at it completely again. Yeah? Of course, uh, you don't see many made in Switzerland products. First of all, the country is small, 9 million people. But secondly, Switzerland specializes in producer goods machine tools, yeah? precision equipment, industrial chemicals. So in terms of consumer goods, yes, I mean, there are some you know, food stuff produced by Nestle, although it produces only 5% of its uh, worldwide output in Switzerland. There are some medicines and those uh, watches that, I mean, I can never buy. So. <laughs> might as well exist that, 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 that in another universe. So people think that, that this country doesn't produce anything, but actually it produces huge amount of manufacturing output. Huh? India's uh, the supposed uh, service success is also highly exaggerated. You know, at one point, uh, Manmohan Singh, uh, the former prime minister of India, proudly argued that if China is the workshop of the world, India will be the office of the world. Yeah? This claim is very thin because uh, the truth is that India's service trade has not even been much of a success. Yeah? Before 2008, India didn't even make a surplus in the service trade. Yeah? It started making surplus in 2008 and basically, it has uh, been making trade surplus in services to the tune of about 1% of GDP. And they have deficit in merchandise trade, which is manufacturing plus, oil plus, yeah, food plus, which is uh, that's more than seven times that. Yeah? What kind of success is this? Yeah? Also, India is, uh, the, I mean, if I don't know how significantly and uh, on what scale artificial intelligence will become uh, available and how soon, but when it happens, India will be the first country to be hit. Yeah? Because the first place where artificial intelligence will be applied will be exactly the kind of uh, the, the routine low-grade knowledge service that India specializes in. So reading MRI scans, you know, doing basic accounting, you know, dealing with the customer complaints. Yeah? 
this is the first thing uh, that the, the AI will be applied. Yeah? So even if uh, the, what it has achieved so far is uh, the, you know, good, which I doubt, I mean, the, the, it's uh, not clear whether it uh, has uh, a sustainable future. Yeah? Okay, so I have uh, criticized all these uh, the arguments uh, that have made us abandon production as a central element in economic development. But people might say, okay, so what? Yeah. What harm has it really done? Well, I, I say that it has done a lot of harms, so let's discuss what they are, you know. Yeah, first of all, the neglect of uh, productive capabilities has made a lot of people think that what countries produce to earn does not matter. You have yeah, uh, uh, pointed this out. You know, to borrow one famous quote uh, from the 1980s when there was a big debate in the United States about the industrial policy because uh, there were some people in the US at the time led by the former Labor Secretary, uh, Robert Reich, who argued that we have to emulate Japanese industrial policy because uh, the, there are better industrial policies, why we are losing ground to them. People who are opposed to industrial policy came out saying it doesn't matter whether you uh, produce microchips or potato chips. Yeah? What matters is how much money you earn. Yeah? So if you can produce huge amount of uh, micro uh, potato chips and earn more money than what you can by producing microchips, that's better. Huh? This line of thinking has made a lot of developing countries complacent about their dependence on primary commodities or cheap assembly. Huh? So the, your commentator, I mean, I forget his name, but that, you know, is uh, casual about uh, the collapse of uh, Brazilian uh, manufacturing industry. Eh? Because, you know, if you can earn more money by exporting soybeans and iron ore, why are you worried? Eh? However, in the long run, different economic activities give different scope for growth and technological development. This was one of the central insights of the Latin American Structural School. So even from a purely growth-oriented point of view, this line of thinking is uh, seriously flawed. Yeah? Okay, it may be true this year, may be true in three years' time, but give it 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, you will fall behind. Yeah? There's no escape uh, that, uh, from that. Secondly, the neglect of uh, productive capabilities has also meant that our assessment for policies have acquired short-term biases. As I mentioned earlier, you know, if you ignore the issue of productive capabilities, which take a long time to build up, I mean, that if you ignore this issue, a lot of policies that are aimed to increase those are look insane. I mean, why do you have uh, infant industry protection? Hmm? Uh, you can buy better cars that, uh, if you decide to import them from Germany or the United States. Eh? Why do you need your own car industry? Hmm? Thirdly, the neglect of the collective dimensions of productive development has made people ignore the issues of how to develop modern firms and other supportive institutions that are central to productive development. You know, in the World Bank and other associated uh, spaces, there are a lot of uh, talk about private sector development, promoting business, yeah? the famous uh, doing business indicator of the World Bank. When you look at uh, these uh, things, uh, you find that this is a totally negative agenda in the sense that all that is required is uh, for the government to get out of the way. Yeah? No, sometimes that may be necessary. Yeah? In some countries, uh, that could be a problem. But 
I mean, this is like uh, the, I mean, very the passive negative agenda. Yeah? So the best the government can do is uh, to quicken the process of uh, the, the processing uh, imports in the customs. Yeah? Keep construction permit quickly. Yeah? And then the rest will be taken care of. No. Building a strong private sector requires huge amount of public intervention. Yeah? Research and development. You know, people think uh, the United States uh, that doesn't have industrial policy. No, they actually have the largest industrial policy in the world. Yeah? Only that it's uh, not called industrial policy. It's uh, called defense, uh, research, and development. Yeah? No, it's actually amazing. I mean, the, the, the whole information economy was created by the, the Pentagon and the US military. Yeah? You know, the Silicon Valley didn't uh, start in Bill Gates' uh, parents' garage. It uh, started in Washington, Pentagon, you know, which uh, taught in huge amount of money in doing research on computer, internet, GPS. The US Navy funded the entire research in the beginning of uh, semiconductors. Yeah? You name it. Taiwan da, 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 and Germany are very good at uh, providing publicly funded or at least at, uh, subsidized uh, consulting services for small and medium-sized enterprises. You know, in a lot of uh, countries, uh, government play a critical role in the worker training. I mean, I can't go on and on about this, but uh, you know, uh, you get the point, yeah. Also, the neglect of uh, production has uh, led to a very partial view of our individual well-being. I emphasize this point. You know, people are not just consumers; they're also producers. Eh? But uh, envisaging people entirely as consumers rather than producers. Issues of employment, quality of jobs, workplace welfare, job security, and so on have been ignored. So given these uh, negative consequences of neglecting production, we need to reconstruct our discourse on economic development by bringing production back in, especially the issue of the development of collective productive capabilities. Of course, uh, this is not to suggest that we can simply go back to the older productionist uh, the traditions. We need to incorporate the more recent theoretical developments and the changes in the real world into our theory. So I have a few things uh, to suggest along the line. So first of all, we need to incorporate the insights from the humanist tradition and pay greater attention to non-material aspects of development like freedom, equality, solidarity, community, and so on. However, emphasizing production, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, taking individuals more seriously should not mean that we take them more seriously only as consumers, as in neoliberal economics, nor just as citizens, with entitlements, as in the humanist approach, but also as producers in whose life, employment, and the contents of their work are very important dimensions. Thirdly, the reflecting the recent developments in the economics of technology and institutional economics, our, our understanding of the production process itself needs to improve with attention paid not just to technologies, but to the role of organizations, institutions, culture, and even politics in the process of development of productive capabilities. And last but not least, the environmental sustainability has to be incorporated into our thinking, but I very strongly disagree with uh, some people who suggest that uh, this means uh, that uh, developing countries should not industrialize Development of productive capabilities, especially in the manufacturing sector, as is, is actually crucial in preventing and adapting to climate change. 
given that they are the ones that possess uh, the necessary technological capabilities, the rich countries need to further develop their product productive capabilities in the areas of uh, green technologies. Yeah? Even just to cope with the adverse consequences of climate change, developing countries need to further develop technological and organizational capabilities, many of which can only be acquired through industrialization. This is uh, quite an important point. You know, to, to illustrate this, although this is not an uh, example of climate change, you know that the famous earthquake in Haiti in 2010. Yeah? It killed uh, at least 100,000 people, possibly over 200,000. And yeah, given that the country only has uh, the, the 10 million people, it means that one or two percent of population was wiped out because of uh, this earthquake. Yeah? This earthquake was uh, on Richter scale level seven. It's the kind of earthquake that Japan has like every other week. And it will hit the headline if one grandmother dies in that process. Yeah? Because Japan has the technologies uh, to build buildings which can withstand you know, very strong earthquakes. Yeah? It has the organization to evacuate uh, one and evacuate people in time and you know all the capabilities that actually came with you know, their industrialization. You know? This is why the same earthquake can wipe out 2% of population in one country and probably you know, kill one or two people in another, another country with nearly you know, 15 times the population. You know? So I think it's that uh, very important to develop uh, productive capabilities even to deal with uh, climate change. Yeah? And of course, uh, we have to develop capabilities in the right areas. Yeah? So I mean, uh, I'm not saying that, that, that just that, that concentrate on the growth and everything will be fine, but you know, that, that I, I think it's uh, very dangerous uh, to twist uh, this concern for sustainability into an argument against uh, the developing countries uh, industrializing. Now, developing and enriching the traditional production is view of economic development with the additions of these new elements that I've just suggested. Of course, that will not be easy, but without uh, doing that, we are not going to be able to promote more rapid, but economically and environmentally more sustainable economic development. Thank you very much. Well, Professor Cheng, thank you again for this wonderful lecture. And we have time for some questions. I would ask somebody to help me with the microphone, the mobile microphone I'm watching. Let's collect some questions. And please, if you can go here to someone, get the phone for me. Roberto. And please identify yourself before the, the question. Um, my name is Georgia. I have uh, two related. I, I have a qu My sort of obvious question is: How would you answer the people like Bill Gates, who go around saying that you know extreme poverty was halved, and the number of people who live with two cents a day has been halved, and it will be eliminated by the year 20x, mm -hmm. and therefore the humanists, the people you call humanists, are doing something right? and the world is getting better the way it never got better before. There is this optimistic streak. There was a Nobel Prize winner in, in economics whose research is about this. Uh, yeah, all right, this is the question. Mm -hmm. yep.
Um, I couldn't have been here yesterday, and I don't know uh, if you have uh, talked about the issue I'm going to introduce. Um, two years ago, Mariana Mazzucato came here and uh, uh, gave a, a very interesting lecture. We adopted uh, some uh, articles and books of her as your books here. And uh, all of you are uh, very, uh, very important for our formation. But I'd like to straight on ask the thing, in which way um, Hajung way of thinking, production, and development, and uh, Mariana Mazzucato way, complement, diverge, uh, what uh, you, <coughs> uh, your subject, uh, 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 there is a range of a lot of subjects. Mariana Mazzucato, uh, of course, uh, he uh, give uh, a very import, big important of the state support of all the innovations. And, uh, but I would like to know the difference uh, between uh, uh, both approaches. Thank you. Uh, maybe one more? Mm -hmm. Hi, Professor Shen, uh, I'm Adilia. And first of all, thank you for your lecture. And I would like to know a little bit more about how do you see the specific challenges related to creating what you say productive capabilities, but I would say social capabilities, right? Uh, in terms of uh, the context of Industry 4.0 and global and regional value chains. And I have a second question, may I? Uh, and uh, as a second question, I would like to know uh, wh if you think that in theoretical terms, we would have to go forward with a kind of a theory of production uh, in the context of Industry 4.0. So would you say that this, was, this is even possible? Can we say that we will have to face it uh, in theoretical terms, okay? Theoretical terms. Yes, okay. thank you. Right, um, yes, uh, in assessing what anything has achieved, I mean, it is important to ask uh, the counterfactual question, yeah? So yes, uh, poverty has been hard, but uh, that could it uh, have been reduced even more if we followed uh, a different approach? You know, I mean, I'm sick of uh, the kind of neoliberals uh, saying things like, oh, we are richer than ever thanks to you know, neoliberal reform. Yeah, I mean, uh, if uh, your output grows uh, more quickly than the, the, your population, you will be always richer than ever. Yeah? That's not the relevant criterion. Yeah? I mean, the relevant criterion is that, uh, you know, if you follow a different policy, could Latin America have seen yeah, higher growth rate than before, or at least that, uh, not so much uh, reduction in growth that, uh, as it happened in the last uh, 35 years. Yeah? So, yes, I mean, that, that, that poverty has been reduced, but, you know, well, apart from the fact that a lot of this uh, reduction was thanks to, you know, productionist that uh, development uh, strategy of China, rather than, you know, kind of humanist uh, inspired uh, intervention in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. I mean, even ignoring that, you know, the question is overall what could have been the case. Yeah? So, no, I, I don't mean to, you know, that, that you know, kind of. Uh, devalue what uh, Bill Gates has done, you know, I mean, unlike uh, most other rich people, he has uh, uh, donated a lot of money for good causes, so, you know, I give him credit for that, but uh, the relevant uh, the, the question should be, could it have been, have been even better, yeah? Uh, what's uh, the difference uh, between 
myself and Mariana. The, well, Mariana mainly focuses on the rich countries and the top end innovation. But the things I'm more concerned about is, you know, in developing countries, people don't even know how to organize a factory, you know, never mind innovation, never mind, you know, that, that, that you know, improving your technology, you know. The machines are in the wrong place, you know, the inventory that the delivery is a the, the nightmare. So I'm, I'm looking at a whole range of uh, the, the, the productive capabilities, not just the top end innovation. I mean, I have no problem with Mariana focusing on that. But my concern is a whole range of things from, you know, teaching how to run a factory in countries like Ethiopia to whether you know Petrobras uh, could innovate more, you know, whether Brazil could, you know, I don't know, Argentina could uh, the import some industrial financing system or uh, the research at the system from Germany or South Korea, you know. So I'm, I'm asking a whole range of questions, and yeah, that. A lot of things that I worry about are very like unsexy, you know. No, because uh, if you can talk about yeah the cutting edge that that uh, innovation and you know how this innovative firm in Finland is doing this and you know, how this uh, the great uh, company in Germany is doing that, yeah, it looks really good. But if you try to persuade people, look, I mean, you first have to you know, learn how to put the machines in the right place, yeah? Then, you know, it looks very boring, yeah? But, you know, uh, so probably that's the difference. I mean, I don't have any disagreement with her that, uh, in, in what she does. Uh, productive capabilities, uh, social capability. Yeah, actually, the, the Moses uh, Abramovitz that uh, used uh, the term social capabilities rather than productive capabilities, but I cho chose to use uh, the term productive capabilities because uh, I want to bring production back into the discourse, even though I recognize that uh, productive capabilities not just about what happens in the factory or in the firm, it's about the general social environment and so on. So yes, I mean, that, that to that extent, uh, that, and I have uh, that, that deliberately chose, chosen this uh, terminology uh, to kind of focus on certain things, uh, not because I, I mean, do not see it as a broader issue. Yeah? Now, what are the things that uh, we need in these respects that are uh, given, you know, industry 4.0, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, global value chains, well, first of all, I think that, that some of these things, uh, I'm not sure whether they are as distinct and real as it is often thought to be, you know. A lot of people who talk about global value chains uh, talk as if this was invented in, yeah, somewhere in the uh, late 1990s. No, I mean, global value chains existed uh, from the 1950s when, yeah. Korea, Taiwan, yeah, the, these countries were doing the worst kind of uh, the, the, the assembly jobs for American electronics companies. Yeah? When Koreans were making wigs with human hair, you know, I mean, these are all yeah, kind of, uh, commissioned by American companies who supplied the uh, JC Penney or the, the, these uh, the department stores, you know. So it's already been there. That, that, that it's of course uh, been extended, spread, yeah, elaborated, but you know, not as new as people think. I mean, same with the fourth industrial revolution. I'm not yet sure. I mean, I'm still open-minded about this. Uh, whether this is really fourth industrial revolution or extension of the third one, the electronics revolution. I think when the bio and nano revolutions become as real as you know, the internet of things and AI and so on, then maybe we will ta -ta -ta enter another techno paradigm. But I'm not sure whether this is you know, uh, that, that, uh, something completely new or extension of the third one. 
But uh, having said that, yes, I mean, uh, these uh, the, the bring up uh, unique challenges. Eh? So I think, I mean, it's not just uh, negative challenges, but uh, it also gives opportunity because that, uh, you know, emergence of these uh, new industries uh, uh, create a possibility for leapfrogging for late developers. Eh? So Germany and the United States took over Britain as uh, the world leading industrial nations in the late 19th century because they got into heavy and chemical industries uh, faster than the British. Eh? I mean, uh, we cannot discuss why, but that's what happened. The East Asian economic miracle was helped greatly by these economies that are getting into electronics that are earlier than many other leading industrial countries and consciously investing huge amount of money to develop uh, capabilities in these areas in terms of research, you know, engineering, university education, what have you. So yes, I mean, these new technologies uh, may open new opportunities for developing countries, especially a uh, country like Brazil, who's still got, although rapidly disappearing, got that, that very impressive uh, the science and engineering capabilities. Yeah? Of course, uh, this is not going to happen automatically. You need a plan, you need aggressive investment, you need the, the uh, kind of uh, basically action, whether it will be done, I don't know, but uh, you know, the, the, there are opportunities. But yeah, in terms of challenges, uh, the basically, I mean, the, the throughout history, those who can control the technological paradigm, but uh, set the parameter for who's getting what. Yeah? So if uh, the, the developing countries that uh, fall further behind in terms of uh, the controlling leading technologies because uh, the lots of new technologies are emerging and they don't use uh, this emergence as an opportunity to leapfrog, then yeah, they'll be even in, in even worse uh, situations. Eh? Now, what do these things uh, theoretically pose? Uh, well, I don't know, I mean, at the very general level, you know, I mean, however fancy and automated and uh, disembodied and so on, uh, these things may be, I mean, the, the, in the end, uh, there are, I mean, the, the material basis for them. In the end, I mean, the, the, there will be, you know, class conflict involved. Uh, in the end, there'll be the, the problems of uh, the collective action and public policy involved. So, yeah, at the, general level I don't see whether that I don't see that, that, that these uh, things require a new theoretical paradigm I mean at the more detailed level yes I mean the way you organize uh, I mean I, I don't know amazon.com is uh, fundamentally different from the way you organize uh, JC Penny or Sears but you know at the more general level that, that I don't see that this uh, requires uh, some kind of revolutionary economic theory Yeah, maybe a few more. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Three there. Hi, good evening, Dr. Chan. My name is Frida. I come from Ghana. My question is, um, often at times, African boast of raw materials, we have a lot of gold, we have a lot of timber and all that. But at the end of the day, you realize we are the poorest country in the world. So I just want to ask you, what is the problem? Why is it that Africa, Africa has a lot of problems when it comes to development? And when you, when you talk about production, we don't have a lot of manufacturing 
companies and especially in Ghana, West Africa. And I can see that um, politics is taking all over because even, even if a, politi a politician comes into power, they have good strategies, but you see another political party overthrowing everything and it looks like we go back and forth. There is no development and econ the economy is always declining. So I just want to ask you, what is the problem and what are the solutions for Africa? Because when you were giving all this talk, I was so sad and I was like, oh, Africa, when is Africa going to be a developed country? So I want to ask you if there is any, uh, your opinion and if there is any solution for Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Chang. Uh, thank you for your lecture. I'm Gabriel. I would like you if you could explore more the relation between collectivism and individualism that you said collectiv collectivism based on uh, economic development uh, related to production and man uh, creating a manufacturing base and individualism based on since the 1980s related to the increasing of health and good services and this paradox or relation if you can say more about that thank you <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, thank you for the lecture. My name is Roberto. Uh, I would like to ask you regarding that statement there that our understanding of production itself needs to be improved with attention paid not, not just on technology but on organizations. Uh, what do you think for the for the <coughs> for the countries under development uh, are the necessary changes or moves on the systems of innovation of each of these countries because we are facing so many disruptive technologies and so many paradigm changes. Uh, what do you think would be the right uh, path for these systems of innovation uh, to uh, leapfrog or do some move to uh, gain some positions and be almost there to compete in this uh, new scenario. Yep. Any more? Yeah. Okay. 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 Right. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Oh. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, I don't know, I mean, uh, where do I begin uh, about Africa, or for that matter, the whole of the developing world? I mean, uh, for many things, we'll have to go back to you know, imperialism, colonialism, and you know, the destruction of social fabric that those things caused, and then you know, the yeah, let's not miss the words. I mean, the racism that is so rampant, and I mean, the people doing research on Africa, you know, uh, and yes, I mean, more recently, the, the kind of uh, capitulation of uh, the many African elites uh, to the dominant paradigm. There are many causes that are behind uh, underdevelopment, and I don't think that, uh, that we can solve this at, at, uh, at one level because, uh, you know, I mean, that the fault of, uh, the, say, dependency theory, in my view, was that uh, it uh, thought everything what was about the global economic system. Yes, uh, it was, but also what you do matters a lot, yeah? structure doesn't determine your destiny. Yeah? Now take the case of South Korea. Yeah? You know, in 1960, South Korea's per capita income was uh, $90. Yeah? Ghana's per capita income was uh, $190. Yeah? We were one of the poorest economies in the world. And then we had the so-called uh, economic miracle from the 1960s. Or was it because uh, that we had some structure in the right place uh, that, that enabled us uh, to do this? Yes, uh, to an extent, because we 
for various uh, the reasons, had the land reform, yeah, so we eliminated uh, the biggest uh, the obstacle to industrialization, namely the landlord class. We had uh, the certain flattening of uh, social hierarchy through uh, Japanese colonialism and the subsequent destruction of uh, the, the traditional society and the Second World War, the Korean War, and yeah, so that, that there were a lot of uh, the things that were there in terms of uh, the structure, but why did it not then in the 1950s with the same uh, global political economy, same social structure, same you know, national political economy not develop because we had a president who was not interested in economic development. Yeah? He was a fierce uh, anti-Japanese fighter, but he was our Marie Antoinette. Yeah? You know, this guy came from a minor branch of the former royal family. You know, he went to Princeton as an undergraduate student when most Koreans didn't even know that there was a country called the United States of America. He married an aristocratic Austrian lady, and yeah, I mean, one, uh, one famous uh, that, uh, episode is that uh, when one year uh, his agriculture minister was uh, telling him that, sir, we had very bad harvest and we have rice shortage, he blotted out, that's the problem with the bloody Koreans, all they want to eat is, eat is rice, you know, why don't they eat beef, you know, why don't they eat wheat, you know, well, sir, we don't produce those things, you yeah? Yeah, so when you have a president like that, it's not going to happen, yeah? Because he wasn't interested, simply, yeah? Yeah, so it, uh, the, the, it's a, I mean, it actually links to, to your question about uh, collectivism versus individualism. You know, on the one hand, you don't want to believe in the Disney, which keeps telling you from the young age that uh, if you believe it in yourself and work hard at it, you can achieve anything, yeah? Yeah. That overemphasis on agency is completely wrong, but you don't want to go to the other extreme and say that it's all because of uh, Africa's climate, you know? it's uh, geography, it's uh, colonial history, this, that, resource curse, you know, African culture, you name it. You, know? you don't want to go to that at the other extreme and say it's uh, all about the, the structure. You know? So similarly with uh, individualism and collectivism, you know, you don't want to you know, the become like uh, Stalin and say, you know, the, let's uh, the, the kill three million people so that you know, I can do these things which is for the greater good. On the other hand, you don't want to the, the, the believe that uh, if all individuals were well-educated, well-fed, and you know, became one person entrepreneur through microcredit, somehow, you yeah, know, countries like Ghana will uh, flourish and uh, become rich, you know, that's a fantasy. Yeah? So, I mean, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that, that uh, we, I mean, the problem we are trying to grapple with is very complex. It cannot be understood at just one level. Yeah? You need to look at everything from agency to structure, you know, history, you yeah? know, political economy of the moment, but then you have to also understand yeah, the global technological trend and you know, the, the, the learn from other countries as to how they manage the, the technological transitions, how they you know, build nothing out of, uh, sorry, the, the, the strong economies out of nothing. Yeah? You know, I, I, some of you are here and I might have uh, said this uh, yesterday, but uh, in 1965, South Korea produced 100 cars per year. Yeah? I mean, now it's uh, the fifth uh, largest uh, the car producing nation in the world. Yeah? I mean, how was that possible? Yeah? I mean, there's no simple answer. It wasn't yeah, because we had yeah, strong leader, General Park Chung hee It uh, wasn't because we were, you know, the, 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 uh, we, we had the, the, this uh, lucky history of land reform. I mean, yeah, all of this uh, contributed a bit, but uh, it, in the end was also about you know, individuals making uh, the, the risky decisions and the, the following uh, them through. And yeah, so you have to understand it at uh, many different levels. Yeah? 
Now, as individual researchers, yes, uh, we have to focus on one thing. You know, yeah, you cannot do everything. Yeah? So I don't see any problem with someone you know, focusing on global political economy to understand why yeah, West African countries are not uh, developing very well. I don't have any problem with uh, the people going into the uh, small scale uh, the firms in Ghana and trying to understand how they struggle with uh, that, uh, improving productivity. I mean, individually, we have to uh, all specialize in these things, but that, uh, in, in the end, I mean, we have to all kind of pool our knowledge collectively to fully understand what are the problems, uh, that, uh, how we solve those problems, and that, uh, what we should uh, you know, individually and collectively do. Yeah? Uh, finally, the, Yes, I mean, uh, I don't know, I mean, all technological innovations are disruptive, you know, I doubt whether, you know, today's uh, the, the innovations are necessarily more disruptive than the invention of uh, the, the steam engine or the internal combustion engine or, you know, uh, many past uh, uh, innovations. Eh? No, I mean, think about uh, you know in, uh, innovations in communications. Yeah, you know when the, we invented the uh, telegraphy, the time that took uh, to relay a message uh, from London to New York was uh, reduced uh, from say two weeks to twenty minutes. Yeah? With the invention of uh, the, the, the internet, the time required uh, for the message uh, to be transferred that uh, that uh, was uh, reduced to from what I mean uh, five seconds that uh, you needed uh, to make a phone call to one second. Yeah? In relative terms, uh, telegraphy was a uh, much more uh, significant uh, the invention. Yeah? By saying this, I'm not saying that uh, that, uh, that uh, I mean uh, what, what is happening now is that uh, uh, necessarily less significant. I mean, especially when it comes to things like bioengineering. I mean, this uh, has a potential to completely change uh, the, the meaning of even what being a human being is. Yeah? So I'm not saying that everything is like that, but uh, we need to first of all kind of put these things into perspective and uh, try to figure out what are really disruptive and what are not and what are just uh, a fashion and what are going to be long lasting because uh, what looks like a great invention today, uh, 10 years later might be you know, uh, totally irrelevant. Yeah? Now, how do you deal with uh, this uh, the inherently uncertain system of, uh, the, sorry, uh, uncertain the, the, the world of uh, technological innovation? I think that uh, at one level, I, I agree with uh, sort of the prevailing opinion that this requires, you know, being like more open and uh, uh, the, the organization is becoming kind of leaner and more agile and so on. But I think that this uh, should not distract us from the need to still provide the collective foundation. You know, as I keep saying. Silicon Valley didn't start in Bill Gates at the parents' garage. Yeah? It started in Pentagon in Washington. Yeah? So how are you going to lay that foundation so that these companies can thrive by being innovative and disruptive and so on? And yeah, the US has uh, laid that system. Germany has this system. Japan has this system. How does Brazil do it? You know, more difficultly, how does Ghana do it? You know, that's uh, the challenge. And, yeah, I think that, that uh, you know, the one quick kind of suggestion is, uh, you know, there's nothing like, I mean, uh, trying to figure out what other people have done, you know. Because uh, the, the, this is a common problem everywhere. I mean, the people really don't know about what other countries are doing, yeah? Do you, I mean, always criticize, I mean, I'm talking about developing countries, you always criticize your country with reference to some idealized version of what the Americans are doing. Yeah? But uh, that idealized uh, uh, version is often very wrong. Yeah? And, you know, uh, let me just uh, give you an example. Yeah? American uh, business school uh, professors and economists have been going on and on about 
the co uh, need for companies to focus on their core competencies. Yeah? This has been one important element in the so-called uh, theory of uh, shareholder capitalism. Yeah? So firms have to focus, yeah? no conglomeration, yeah? drop uh, marginal businesses. Yeah? While they are doing it, actually American com uh, tech companies are all becoming conglomerates. Yeah? Google became Alphabet, yeah? because they realized that they need to diversify, they need to move into other areas. Yeah? But then, unfortunately, people in Korea, people in Brazil, they only listen to American business school professors. Yeah? And they say, we should abolish our conglomerates. Yeah? No, please uh, watch what other people do. Yeah? Moreover, Americans are actually the exceptions. Yeah? In many areas, actually, Americans and the British are the exceptions. You know, the continental European countries are doing something completely different. But very few people know actually what they do. You know, I often joke that the secret of Swiss success is to keep everything secret. Yeah? <laughs> no, seriously, I uh, have tried to look for material on Swiss industrial policy by Swiss uh, cantonal government. Yeah? There's nothing. Yeah? Well, at least in English. Yeah? Maybe that's uh, the secret of their success because uh, they don't want other people to know what they are doing. Yeah, yeah so the, you know, the, maybe the Swiss are laughing, okay? Yeah, they all think uh, we are just making cuckoo clocks, yeah? Anyway, so the, yeah, my, my, I mean, the please that, uh, the, that we yeah, need to think uh, very seriously about uh, building that uh, the infrastructure that will enable the, 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 this uh, disruptive innovation and in understanding how that can be done. I mean, this a uh, significant amount of research uh, by people like uh, Richard Nelson and uh, Ben Tokyo Lundberg and yeah. so look at those and you know, let's uh, discuss what, uh, which of these things may be feasible and desirable in the Brazilian context, yeah? Thank you. So, thank you very much again, and thank you everybody for the audience. Good afternoon, good night, almost. Thank you.